Hi, everyone. Welcome to this SHARE webinar, uh, Goal Setting, Creating Space Outside of Cancer. Um, I'm going to just uh, wait to start for another minute or two because actually it takes a little bit of time for people to get logged in uh, and get through the GoToWebinar setup. So I'm just going to wait a minute or two more before we start. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and start now. Um, so welcome to Goal Setting, Creating Space Outside of Cancer. Our guest speaker, with our guest speaker today, Julie Larson. I'm Stephanie Bofarb. I'm the Ovarian Cancer Program Director at SHARE. And before this presentation begins, I wanted to tell you a little bit about SHARE. So SHARE is a nonprofit organization that has been, that for the last 43 years has been helping people through breast or ovarian cancer by offering the support of those who've been there. SHARE offers many services, including helplines, telephone and in-person support groups, and educational programs. All our services are free of charge to participants. For more information, visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. So during this presentation, uh, participants will be muted. Uh, when the presenter finishes speaking, we'll open up for Q&A. We have, there's a Q&A, uh, question pane on your screen on the GoToWebinar software, and you can click on that at any time during the presentation and type in your questions, and we will save those for the end. Um, so please, you're welcome to submit questions throughout the presentation. Um, when asking your questions, remember to keep them general, not too personal. Um, we are, you know, not too specific to your personal situation, but we want them to be helpful to everybody. Um, this webinar will be recorded and will be up on the website soon. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Julie Larson, LCSW, is a practicing psychotherapist who has helped countless people who find themselves facing an unexpected turn in the road because of an unforeseen medical diagnosis. Before starting her practice, she was the director of young adult programming at Cancer Care. She presents regularly to professionals, caregivers, and survivors on a range of issues relating to being young and impacted by cancer. Julie also facilitates our monthly topic-driven roundtable for women with ovarian cancer. This discussion group meets monthly to discuss a different topic relevant to their diagnosis each month. The next topic-driven roundtable for women with ovarian cancer will take place on April 10th at 1 p.m. Eastern time and will feature a nutritionist guest speaker. So take it away, Julie. Thank you, Stephanie. It is always nice to work with Cher, and I appreciate and um, am honored to be working with you and doing this webinar today. Um, welcome to the webinar. For all of you who have dialed in and joined us today, welcome and sit back, get about a piece of paper and pen. I hope that this hour for you is a time to just gather information. Maybe it's a time to reflect and think about on what this topic means to you. Let my words kind of guide you and inform you, and I am more than interested in your questions as, as we go. So like Stephanie said, if something resonates for you or a question pops up, don't hesitate um, to pop that into the question, mark, question bar, and we'll get to those at the end. So this topic, um, goal setting, creating a space without cancer. And you know, when I first got this topic, I thought to myself, a space without cancer. I mean, when we're talking to cancer patients or survivors and also caregivers, 
cancer has a significant impact on their life and their identity. How in the world do you even parcel out or push away cancer on any level? It affects us physically. It affects emotionally and mentally. It affects and impacts relationships professionally, certainly, and also spiritually. So um, as I began to kind of rumble with this topic, it was with the understanding that cancer permeates much of who you are once you hear that diagnosis and not just for the survivor, but, but also for the loved ones and, and who surround you. So I'm aware that there's some complexity to that, even as we begin this, this conversation. Also, it made me think that when people walk into my office, they come um, mourning often their life before cancer. There's a, and when I say those words, um, without cancer, does that even trigger that awareness of a loss, that, that life today is not the same as life before, quote unquote, without cancer. So the very black and white implication of life without cancer, um, does that trigger a sense of it's not the same? I, I can't ever go back. There's no returning, that there's a difference now. And, and I think that's important to talk about too, because um, you know I watch in my office and when we begin to use the word grief and loss um, related to certain things that people care deeply about or, or aspects of their own character or identity, there's feelings of loss and that loss um, is numbness, shock, sadness, frustration, right? Frustration, irritability, uncertainty, fear, vulnerability. All of those pe all of those feelings are a part of this experience of um, living with cancer. I bring that up because until we can kind of get present and grounded in right now, which might be the pathway to finding little corners and peaks of time when we can compartmentalize and find some space from the intensity of cancer, we have to accept that it's different. And I and I say the word acceptance, woo, that's gonna get kind of a bad rap, that word, and it's a heavy one to hear. Acceptance is not approval. It's not passiveness. It's not saying, oh, this is wonderful and great, and it's a horizon, and now suddenly everything feels feels okay. It's not that at all. It It's basically saying it is what it is, that um, life is different than it was. There are things that are not the same. There may be things that are gone for now, but it is what it is. When we put down ideas of what life should be, and then it's only then that we are more free to wholeheartedly say yes to life as it is. In fact, before we have that period of kind of acceptance, we're fighting. So everything feels like a struggle. You know, we're fighting against, oh, this is the way it should be, or this is the way I want to feel, or this is how I want to engage. And when we just begin to accept, you know what, there are limits, or there are things I'm not going to be able to do, or there are things that I want to do at this level, but I can do at this level. We begin to understand that, then we're more able to face the anxiety, the fear. It teaches us the truth of impermanence. So that's one of my um, points here that all things change and shift. And, um, and I tell people, you know, when you think about impermanence, people can walk into my office um, and be struggling and distressed and, and, and feeling not comfortable with, where, with some, something that's going on. And I'll listen to that. And those feelings are very valid and understandable and important. But I sometimes say, let's bookmark this. Let's remember that today on Wednesday, March 27th, this is the level of intensity that you're feeling. This is how you feel today. Let's bookmark it. Because perhaps in a week, maybe just a day, maybe a week, maybe three months down the road, you'll feel differently. And I think it's wise to kind of be able to do that own perspective driven insight for yourself. So I'll give you that as a, as a, as a, um, a, a task or as something to think about for yourself. If you find it's a hard day, circle it on your calendar, make a note and then follow back and say, do I feel different the next day? What changed? What's, what's different? Do you feel different three months from now? When you look back in your life, do things feel different, right? So sometimes 
even just the gift of impermanence can be your best friend, that there's constant changing. But back to this place of that acceptance is our pathway. It's like the door toward being present. Being present is the awareness that of what is, what is right now. And our anxieties and our worries about the future, they will take us way into the future, right? Anxiety and fear, that consumes us and it kind of lives in the future, in an unknown future. Regret, sadness, depression, some things, some those feelings kind of are about rehashing or reliving the past. And when our mind and our emotion is so consumed with either or, then we are crowding out the present. In the present, your right now is the only time, actually, that you have to live. The only time that you have to create, to engage with other people, to experience things, to, um, to challenge yourself, to embrace new opportunities. The now is that moment. So if our energy and our thought is all wrapped up in the future, i.e. anxiety and fear and uncertainty, or it's lost and consumed by the past, whether that's sadness, regret, grief, loss, then we're squeezing out our right now. And I don't in any way want to minimize that anxiety because it's understandable. It makes sense. Or minimize the experience of sadness and, and loss because those are also valid. But if that just awareness within you brings you center and helps to ground you back into your now, that might be helpful. Um, this slide is titled the counterintuitive nature, this you know, the counterintuitive coping. And, and I say this because, you know, oftentimes when something's consuming us, whether that is a fear or a worry, our relationship, something that's it's bothering us, upsetting us, sometimes our instinct is to dive deeper into that. Okay, I'm gonna fix this, I'm gonna really understand it, I'm gonna look into this more, I'm gonna see if there's a way through this, I'm gonna dive in and I'm gonna look at this even more closely. But balance might mean that what you're needing is somewhere else in your life. That it might be counterintuitive to turn away, to kind of turn down the volume of that worry by escaping, kind of back to the title of this workshop, of this webinar, escaping over into another priority, another value of your life. So for example, if your worry and fear is consuming you, if that cancer feels like it's overwhelming, all the time. Um, how does it work for you? Instead of diving into that, instead of kind of seeking out more cancer-related support, more cancer, what would it be like to go off with a bunch of friends and do an, a hobby or a passion or something that you once you always love? To walk away from the cancer for a bit, to leave it. So I know that we can't completely separate, but sometimes it helps us to cope with those intense feelings by turning our attention other places. It turns the you know, the metaphor of turning the volume down or turning the lights on in the rest of the room, that there's more available to you. Finding balance. When we think about balance, and I often talk to people about, this is a, this is a, um, I don't know if any of you in the, in the group today have done the Wheel of Life before, but in essence, this is the Wheel of Life. And what it's kind of talking about is the fact that we are complex people. Our identity is made up of many different values and many different priorities. They're things that matter a great deal to us. And often when we feel out of sync or we feel out of balance, our things don't feel quite right, are overwhelmed, um, not sure where to move or what to do next. Some other priority in our life, one priority in our life is consuming all of our attention. It's taking up too much of the pie. It's a, and where can we pour more of our energy and our attention into something else that matters a great deal to us? It's another piece of our priority so that it balances out. Um, so what you would do with this, um, this kind of, tool is that you notice that there are six blank spots. On those six spots, I would challenge you to put six different priorities to you. So that might be our pieces of your identity. So it might be your, um, your relationship. 
whether that is um, a spouse or a partner to your kind of your relationship or a significant other. Maybe it's friends and family. Um, maybe it's your professional life is about is a piece of who you are. Um, hobbies and interests. Perhaps your faith or spirituality is a is a part of who you are. Um, health. Health could be, you know, beyond medicine and treatment, but diet and fitness, that could be a part of something that's a priority or something that matters a great deal to you. So you can identify what are the things about you as an individual that are significant to you. Put those things out there. Put those things on that list. And then measure, zero being the center of the circle, 10 being the outside. Put a dot somewhere on that um, axis. Well, how fulfilled or satisfied you feel today in that particular area? So if it's professional and you are really feeling like you're behind, you're not doing your best job at work to, at, right now, you're, you're unable to keep up with things, you're not sure how much people are valuing you or respecting your, your um, position in the office, you might put that as like a two. You may doesn't feel as fulfilling and rewarding to you today. Family and friends, maybe that is a place where you feel very connected right now and heard and understood and actualized. Then that might be someplace that you feel more of an eight or a 10. So once you've kind of measured those different things, then draw, then you would draw like a connect the dots between the dots. And then we look at that and is that a wheel? Most of the time, it's not exactly a wheel. It looks like a bit of a bumpy ride, but you can immediately visualize, okay, it's right here where I have a dip. It's right here where I'm not feeling completely myself or my best me. And then that might be where you pour some of your attention. And that could be a place that's outside of cancer. When we think about life balance, why is this so important? Why does it matter so much? Why, why do people tote balance and all of this all the time? Well, when people feel that sense of balance, they don't feel completely overwhelmed and more in one particular area or different areas of their life, they have lower stress levels. It combats anxiety. Often it's perspective, provides perspective that sometimes some, something can be incredibly stressful over here, but when I go over here, it gives me the perspective that I was unable to grab when I was so entrenched in this before, that my cancer diagnosis can leave me feeling exhausted and overwhelmed and, and uh, uncertain and hopeless at times. And when I get back to my group of friends and either join them for bridge or my other fellow moms in the pickup line at school, it helps me to ground myself in my present. It keeps me focused that what I have right now is valuable and there is a quality of life to my, to my exact present. It gives perspective and it helps to balance out that worry. Similarly, and I talk to people about this all the time, are the flip of that is that sometimes people feel like, gosh, when I'm with all of those friends or family of mine that do not have any experience with cancer, I don't feel completely understood or it heightens my sense of frustration that I can't keep up or that I'm not able to, I'm not able to be as involved as I once was. And that triggers that sense of irritation or loss that I feel. So sometimes in those moments, it helps me to go back to my peer to peer in the world of cancer when it normalizes, you know, hey, I'm in the middle of treatment or I'm still dealing with side effects or long-term effects. And that reminds me that even though I am actively engaged in my quote unquote other life, I am dealing with things that those other people who aren't dealing with cancer aren't. And so it helps to remind me and to normalize that experience. And so if both of those, if you can see that both of those sides of yourself can balance and give you perspective for the other that can be helpful. And that balance can improve your self-esteem and boost your energy, provides perspective, and leads to a sense of belonging, you know, that we can find others, you know, there are different pockets of people, we need them and we get something from them at different times in our life. So understanding that. Shifting gears intentionally. Um, to move from these different pieces of yourself 
can be, you can't just pop in and out of that. So you can't walk out of doctor's appointments and then straight into a group of friends that have no, um, that are not dealing with the same depth of, of experience that you are. It can feel disconcerting and it can feel frustrating in and of itself. So practicing some development of transitioning your transition rituals so that when you walk away from something, you give yourself a little space that you can honor where you were, like if it was a doctor's appointment, it was a follow-up appointment, honor what news you heard, this is part of your life, and then intentionally say, and now the rest of my day is free, and I'm going to get centered back into my now and and, and be with these this group of friends and, and connect with them. Or now I'm going to go home into my house, I'm gonna do these things that matter a great deal to me, get centered in my now. How you, how you develop those transition rituals. I know for myself, even when I think about transitioning, I often just take even a moment to wash my hands, go to the bathroom, as simple as that, as trivial as that, that gives me a beat, it gives me a moment to separate and move between different parts of my day. The second point I have, recognizing the value of different types of relationships. And I don't know if this, um, when you think about this, if this makes sense to you, but fine tuning your own awareness about who you need and why you turn to those particular individuals at different times is an important piece of self-care. And when we think of all the people that are available to us and that are in our picture and supporting us, um, those different individuals have different strengths. Some of those people are very capable of sitting with us when we have hard feelings and listening in all the right ways. And we feel heard and we, our needs are met and we feel capable of just being with them. Other people, it's harder for them to tolerate that. Or they want to immediately problem solve or jump to you know conclusions or turn away completely. Some people want to be able to give and to do things for us and are generous with their time and, and are ready to jump and be available to you. Other people are very busy and they're not. So your work to kind of begin to understand those others in your life, in some ways categorizing those people so that you're turning to the right relationship based on what you're needing today. That you don't jump and ask somebody for, for help or spontaneous you know, moment to get together with, some, with the person that's always busy and never really has the time. Sometimes we do that, we test our relationships. You know what, I'm gonna try again. I'm gonna ask again, ah, yep, yet again this person felt, failed me. They didn't meet me, they didn't even listen, they didn't come, they didn't say that they could. Yet again, they're busy. We keep testing that. And it, but the point you become aware, you know what? That person isn't available to me in the ways that I need them. I need to jump over to this person who is consistently available or who is wanting to be present with me. This other person is able to listen when I'm concerned and worried. They, they are able to tolerate that. Learning and understanding who is in our support network and how they best meet our needs is an important part of yourself. It protects you from feeling hurt and feeling disappointed. And then, you know, people often say, yeah, but without, you know, what is, what do you mean by, you know, choosing things outside of cancer? How do I do that? What do I go back? There are things I can't do anymore. There are things I mean, what would I even begin? What are the passions or what are the interests that you've historically loved? I'm working with a woman right now who um, is post-treatment breast cancer. Actually, she just finished radiation. And um, at the point she was diagnosed, she's a professional photographer. She takes pictures of little babies, like newborn baby pictures, those adorable little, you know, tiny, tiny baby pictures. And at the point she was diagnosed, she felt immediately like um, this photography career was too much. It was too overwhelming. She felt she did not feel the motivation to do it. It felt trivial related to everything else that she was doing. Um, the workload of downloading, editing the pictures, and sending back the, the portfolios to her clients was too much, too much detail. It was exhausting. She didn't feel like she had the chemo brain was kicking in, the, the mental capacity to do it. So therefore that led to feeling even more frustrated and irritable. And then just even doing the shoots was exhausting. She didn't have the physical stamina. So all of that fell off. 
And, and she even pushed it away because it, it just was triggering this feeling of overwhelmed, right? Um, and honestly, throughout treatment, her focus needed to be on going through treatment. And she was busy with doctor's appointments and all of that. So in some ways, there wasn't even a true sense of loss because other things took attention. Well, now that radiation is over, now that she's kind of beginning to think about, okay, now what? Who am I? What do I do? How do I spend this time? What am I missing? She's picked up her camera again. And she hasn't started back with clients, but she's just begun to get out in her yard as the weather turns and takes pictures of flowers to re-experience and to re-find that joy that she has always had for photography, to get back to what initially always made her gravitate toward that art. And it, so, so some of this isn't just, you know, recreating the wheel or, refine, or finding a new passion. It's listening and reflecting back to, you know what, I've always enjoyed gardening. I've always enjoyed playing cards. I've always enjoyed getting out and walking. I haven't felt like I could do it, but maybe if I started slow or maybe if I did it at a different level, that it would still bring me some glimmer of that joy that I've always felt. It's a part of who you are. That piece of your identity hasn't changed, isn't gone. How do you refine that? And I can tell you this particular client, as she begins to kind of ramp up, she's actually getting kind of excited to begin to take pictures of little babies again. And she's feeling a re-motivation um, to get back into that and is even aware of what has changed within her perspective now that she's gone through this experience of being treated with cancer. That the way she approaches even framing that picture or looking at that, um, looking at working with that client feels and looks different to her now based on her experience. When we are working to understand ourselves, what is it that I can use to ground my ground me to find a place where cancer isn't completely monopolizing my worry and my fear, my uncertainty? Who am I now? Refer to this piece of yourself called the gap. Find the gap to find you. That our thoughts and our feelings, our memories, the words of other people, the expectations of other people, the shoulds and the musts that we feel from our culture or whatever it is, all of those things can create a chatter a white noise of inner dialogue in your head. Oh, I should be doing this. Or uh, people are expecting me to do this. Or I, I used to be able to do this and now I recognize that I can't. All of that chatter, 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 chatter. But if you're quiet, in a quiet moment, if you sit still, behind all that noise is a space that we've referred to as the gap. It's quieter. It's the state of a restful awareness, a place where you're content. And that, that frame of focus can ground you and remind you of who you are, who you have always been, how you meet each day uniquely in your own personal way. Where can you quiet all of that voice and those, those expectations and those thoughts and get back to who you are? Listen very closely. What do you, no one else, what do you hope? For yourself what do you who do you consider your best self what does that look like how does that best self relate to others what does that best self do with a saturday with no plans what do you do where how does that best self come forward when you begin to really listen and reflect on who that might be what gives you a sense of purpose and that doesn't need to be anything that you achieve or that you do um, it might be who you are. Um, interestingly, you know, I just just got around to watching the um, Mr. Rogers documentary, Won't You Be My Neighbor, which is shocking because Mr. Rogers is, quite frankly, one of my, like, idols. I think he's amazing. And if you haven't seen his documentary that came out this fall called Won't You Be My Neighbor, I recommend it. And because he's just a phenomenal human being. <laughs> but... Um, one of the big underlying messages of that, and this resonates for this slide for me, is that it isn't you, it's being special isn't anything that we do or anything that we achieve, that we're already special. You are already uniquely purposeful 
and what you what who you are is important and valuable and in in this experience with cancer boy oh boy it can challenge every single piece of what you think about yourself a lot of it feels gone a lot of it feels very very different we feel a sense of incapability or loss fear anxiety um, anger how do we get back to that sense of who we are now that through line This topic, the, the title of this um, slide came from one of my clients. I'm working with someone who has metastatic breast cancer. She is five years since her recurrence. And um, she talks often with me in our sessions about how there's a sense of failure for those who have experienced the recurrence. Oh, they didn't beat cancer, right? You're not, you're not past cancer or beyond cancer. Um, there's a sense that you know you didn't you didn't do something failed and maybe that was you right and that's that's hard. I think that sometimes that doesn't just go for those living with advanced stage or metastatic disease, but anyone. Like why did this happen to me? What about my body feel didn't work or is, why did this happen? That sense of betrayal from your body. And if we get caught in this paradigm of life before cancer and life after cancer, we might never feel like we get there, right? We might never feel like we make it to life after cancer because in truth, cancer is now a piece of who you are. It's a part of the, the, the tapestry of you. So I really loved the other day when we were working and she said, I think it's more about living over cancer that even with this diagnosis and even with her stage four disease, she is living over cancer. And I really loved that paradigm shift. And I don't know if that resonates for any of you, but to me, it's, it's thinking about instead of waiting until, instead of a contingency that when this happens, then you can start living right now. Nothing's holding you back. What's missing when that feeling of distress our inadequacy, our that just whatever that feeling is, when that when that cancer bogs you down and you it leads to feeling that way, what is missing? Can we set goals for that? Can you begin to look at how do I begin to find ways to bring that back into my world, into my life? If you don't know, or if you're kind of not sure, when did you last feel joy? I asked my clients that a lot. When do you last? When did you last feel content? When was joy in your life? And some people are very quick to say, oh my gosh, well, I mean, if I'm really being honest this morning, I was laughing with my spouse over coffee or I was talking with a very good friend about this and we were just really having a great deep conversation and that felt nice. Sometimes we can get so hyper-focused on what's not working that we're missing all that is working. And right there is where maybe life feels a little bit fuller or quote unquote without cancer. So when did you last feel joy? How do you tune in to those moments that feel nice, that feel lighter, that feel less complicated? Pay attention. What do you appreciate about your life? Um, and practice gratitude. So again, this kind of leans to, you know, when the volume is up on everything that's not working or the losses that you have, and I don't want to minimize those things because the feelings that are associated with that loss are very important. But on the balance of that, since this is about balance and since this is about the other side, how do you practice gratitude? Because it's within that gratitude, we, we, we can lean on gratitude to find joy. That when things feel really hard, that when you begin to count blessings, count what you do have, that's when you kind of find your doorway to joy and contentment. So how do you practice gratitude? And again, gratitude in the things that we feel grateful for don't have to be giant and spectacular. It can be the simplest thing of, I am so thankful for this warm cup of coffee. I love having my home. And this room is, is so inviting and warm to me and I enjoy being in this space. I am so grateful to have this sunny skies today so that I can get out for a walk. I'm grateful for those whoever planted those tulip bulbs and crocuses because seeing them sprout up through the dirt right now just makes me feel good. Whatever, it doesn't need to be big. 
however you find that in those quiet, simple moments. When you get there, that's when you can see what is. So again, back to that, way back to that slide of acceptance. It's not until we get to a place of saying, okay, I'm that, that what if and that worry is consuming me. I've got to get back here to what is. That's when we begin to understand how we walk through our day to day. What are your intentions? And intentions are more than goals. Intentions are a perspective. They are uh, maybe a piece of your character, something that's important to you about how you face the day, your relationships. They come from your core beliefs and your values. And it's there where you find clarity on what you really want. You know, I think understanding, and we don't do this enough, you know, we breeze through, we, life gets very busy, right? We get very, very busy in our lives. And I'm very, it, it, unless you're in therapy or unless you're in part in these types of groups right now, we're talking about it. We don't stop sometimes to really reflect and think, okay, really, what are my values? Like I could maybe rattle off some like faith, family, um, honesty, um, authenticity. What are, what are your values? But if you rattle off 10 values, that's diluting it. If you were to really name, okay, you know what? I function on these top two things. What would those top two values be that drive everything for you? Because when you're met with a hard moment on the road, it's then that we lean on our values. It's then that we hold fast to what we, what guides us and what holds us up. How you find those values is where you find clarity. It's where you find your ground. It's who you want to be, who you believe you are. And even in the moments when you're not at your best, when you're struggling, it's holding on to that and knowing, you know what, this is a piece of who I am and I will find my way back to this. And it's how we want to interact with the world. So I sometimes challenge my, my clients to begin to think about that, begin to look deeply into, okay, what are my values? How are they uniquely mine? Maybe a little different than other people. And how do I wake up in the morning and just make a habit of setting my intention for the day. Today, my intention is to listen closely, to work to understand, to, um, to pay closer attention to, to things around me. My, what are your intentions? I want to be calm. And in being calm, I set the intention of being more mindful today, of slowing down. When you set that for the day, it's like setting the clock. It's like setting the pace. So it changes your lens as you start your day. And then likewise, it's sometimes it's nice to bookend the day and to end the day in a similar practice of like with our gratitude. You know, how do I end this day of recognizing this is what really worked today. This is what I'm grateful for. These are the moments that just I felt glimmers of joy and peace. This is what was there. All these other things were there as well. But these, this also was part of the day. I don't know how many of you are familiar with John Kabat-Zinn. He's kind of known as the grandfather of mindfulness, in particular mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is all about how being present and tuning into the right now does miraculous evidence-based things like lower your blood pressure, keep you more healthy, strengthen your immune system. And there's science out there that shows that. So it's kind of amazing. And, it, and there's a lot that backs mindfulness and present-oriented um, behaviors. John Kabat-Zinn, again, is the kind of the grandfather behind that. You can find a lot about him. But here are two of his quotes that I just think are um, nice to kind of remember or know. Patience is the ability to bear difficulty with calm and self-control. It requires connection with your core faith and courage. It also requires kindness and compassion for yourself as you bear the upset of a situation. So I love that piece about compassion for yourself. Aren't we all <laughs> struggling in some ways with compassion for ourselves, even, even in our best days of feeling pride and feeling confidence and feeling capable? It's still that we don't always give ourselves enough credit or that we're kind when we struggle. 
When we struggle, we often beat ourselves up about it. We often feel less than or un, are incapable or perceive ourselves of not, not, able to cap, not able to cope. We would show our friends and our families so much more compassion often than we would show ourselves. And so sometimes the space without cancer begins by saying, of course, this is rough. Of course, you feel upset. It makes sense that you feel confused. It makes sense that you feel uncertain. Why wouldn't you feel overwhelmed? Giving yourself that sense of compassion and comfort and acknowledgement, sometimes allowing ourselves that tenderness can help us find our way back to the present moment quicker, right? Because if we're fighting it, we're fighting it, we're beating ourselves up about not doing okay, then it's harder to rebound. It's harder to feel confident when you've just given yourself a whole barrage of why, you know, it's not good that you were feeling that way. Show that self-compassion. And then the second quote, impatient, impatience often arises when we call, when we rail against reality, wanting things to be different than they actually are. In contrast, the wise self self recognizes the truth that things have a life cycle of their own, separate from your own wants. And as you learn to accept this truth, your patience grows. To build patience, you must learn to recognize impatience and the urge to rush through one moment to get to the next. And to me, that ability to recognize impatience and the urge to rush through, that is self-compassion. Oh, there I am. I just don't want to feel this way. I want to feel different. I want it to go away. I want to get to the place without cancer. And if I could just fix problem solve and maneuver this, then I wouldn't feel this way. When maybe sometimes the way to that space when you don't feel that intensity is to be patient with the feeling because it will change and it will, it, will, it will lead you somewhere different. So I'll leave you this, I'll leave this slide up there about patience and self-compassion. We've got about 15 minutes right now. And I know there might be some questions out there. Maybe some things have resonated for you. Maybe I haven't talked about something that you were hoping I would talk about. So um, I open up the floor to all of you. And um, you can, I think that um, Stephanie's gonna kind of lead the way with regard to questions. Yes, hi. Thank you so much for that, you know deep dive into thinking about um, framing our lives with cancer. Um, so I just want to remind folks that you can submit questions on the question pane on your GoTo, on the GoToWebinar software on the side of your screen there. If you want to type in any questions, um, we'll read them out and, and discuss them with Julie. Um, we had a few questions that were submitted in advance, so I'll start with those. Um, the first question is, uh, how far out should I set my goals time-wise? Or, yeah, mm -hmm. your, your goal, what you've spoken about with goals is more general, but yeah, how would you? Yep, setting goals. And I think that that is a, is um, a common feeling that people have, is that they, I can't visualize my future. So when people talk about setting goals, well, what in the heck do you mean by that? Because it's very difficult for me to plan. It's very difficult for me to even begin to abstractly conceptualize down the road um even though my worry and my fear lives out in the in the future <laughs> i personally can't visualize anything further than today and so first of all to say there's some um concern over that is normal i think that makes sense i deal with that a lot with or i talk to people a lot about that i think how far to set your goals is personal to you but when we think about goals, they don't have to be something that you, again, you're achieving or that you are um, working to accomplish. A goal can be in real time. A goal could be I am working and setting a goal for myself to be more present. I'm setting a goal for myself of catching what my triggers of anxiety are and learning how to ground myself when I begin to feel that spin. That can be a goal. So that's very present. So up oh, there it is. There's that I just got triggered and my head is starting to race. The anxiety is beginning to hijack my moment. And I'm going to work on my goal of actively grounding myself right now. So a goal can be something that is very present oriented. Other goals could be, you know, I do want to get back to certain hobbies and I don't know what that means. Maybe let's just use 
reading, but I don't have attention or I can't organize my thoughts. You know what? I'm going to start slow. How can you parcel and break down a goal into something that feels much more manageable for you? You don't need to search and shoot for the moon, but you know what? I'm going to start by reading magazines because magazines are short and sweet and I can flip through it and it feels like something I can, I can embrace and do. If it's gardening, I'm going to start by getting out in the yard and walking around and kind of visualizing what I want. Start slow. Don't dive right in. And so I don't know if you can take that for yourself as far as a goal and then wind it back into something that feels a little simpler, but that might be a way to start. I don't know if that helps with um, answering that question, but that's Yeah, that's good. Um, so actually, we now we have a few questions coming in. So here's one. Um, well, here's one, a quick one. Do you have any good suggestions of books or resources for folks that uh, on, on mindfulness that for, for beginners? Mm. Um, so there's there's a couple apps out there too. I don't know if you have a if I have a phone or a smartphone or things, but you know technology is actually working with us in in so many ways too. There's there's a couple apps. One's called Headspace, um, and then there's another one called Mindful, I believe, and those can be really helpful because they're guided. So they can kind of lead you along. <laughs> I read a review once, or I heard a commentary one time. People were talking about, oh, Headspace didn't work for me because I constantly fell asleep. Well, maybe part of calming yourself is to stop that spin so that you do fall asleep. You know, who knows what your goals are for mindfulness to stay very present. But um, those can be really great things that can guide and lead you to, um, to feeling more mindful. I stand by... When I, what I said about John Kabat-Zinn, he is, you know, got tons of books out there. He's published many, many books. So you search his name and a lot's going to come up and be available to you. Mindful. Um, and then um, I would say, you know, also to search when you search that too, you can search by zip code um, about mind, N-B-S-R, M, mindful, based, mindfulness, based, stress reduction. MBSR. And there are a lot of different facilitators across the country who are leading, often it's a six to eight week course on mindfulness based stress reduction. So teaching people these tools to learn how to regulate blood pressure, regulate heart rate, um, all, um, all of these things, all of these immune, these physiological stress responses by being mindful. And when you learn those tools, it can be incredibly um, helpful. So you can do, when you go to mindfulness, MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction um, workshops, there are places where you can search by zip code and see if there's anything near you. That'd be interesting to kind of dive into. Okay. Um, and here's another question somebody just submitted. If you look quote unquote normal, i.e. no hair loss and that kind of thing, people assume you're living a normal life when in fact you may be living with an advanced cancer, stage four, metastatic, et cetera, and living a highly medicalized life. How can you fill that gap of misunderstanding? Mm, that's hard. And, and I think that um, this, is, this is a place where I, when I talk to different people in a similar situation who feel like they, quote, un, they look quote unquote normal, but they're not. There's not only is there the cognitive, you know, mental and emotional um, impact of what their reality is, but there also is a physical difference, right? Different level of energy, different possibly other symptoms that are more invisible that people don't see. Um, and that disconnect with others who are not in that place can feel very disconcerting. So I think, first of all, just recognizing that there may be even with as much communication and as much explanation as possible, there are likely just places or limits to the level, to the degree of understanding that someone who is not living in their shoes would be able to have. Um, and this goes back to also different people in your circle. There are likely those in your support network who are able to be more empathetic, to listen deeper, to be very curious and interested in trying, working to understand. And then there are others just simply are not capable of doing that. And we can fight that and struggle with that, or we can just learn to accept that. That from this particular person, 
they're never going to get there. They're never going to fully understand the depth of this. They might get these first surface level type things that I have to go to doctor's appointments all the time, but they don't understand the depth of what that means or what I'm sitting and juggling in my head when you're talking about planning a vacation in two years. So they are not going to get that. And that in and, and reminding yourself and just accepting that that may be it is what it is might calm some of that struggle within you. Still, that need to feel understood is important. That need to be seen and known matters. And so that's where I think it's important to find groups like share or support groups or places where you can connect to other peers. This is where I'm talking, you know, I work with a, a woman who is um, stage four breast cancer, looks, doesn't look at all like she's dealing with treatment at, at all. You'd never guess. And in fact, it's very, um, she's very involved and active in many different things in her kid's life and in the community. You might never know. But she absolutely talks about that there are times when she 100% needs her cancer people. <laughs> so she has to go to her survivor peers because they get it and they can validate and understand her in a way that no one else can. And, and then on the other hand, even outside of that cancer world, her spouse, certain very good friends are able to listen and be there for her. And that's, that's, that's helpful, but it's not the same depth of understanding. So I think we can rail against, like those words from John Cambot's and we can rail against the reality that you want people to get it, you want people to understand, but they just may not. And so we might just need to give up that fight, accept it for it is what it is, and find that our needs can be met elsewhere. Okay, um, another question. How can we align these kinds of goals that you've been speaking about, personal goals, with the reality of too many current to-dos? I'm sorry, what did you say? Too many what? Current things on our to-do lists. You know, like how do you not just get more stressed out by having more things to do when, when you're trying to add these personal uh, goals? Yep, yep, yep. I, you know, have you ever heard the quote, um, don't let the urgent crowd out the important? Oh, I love that. And, you know, you, um, our world is caught in that, right? That we have so much to do. We're very, very, very busy. We're overscheduled. We're, we're constantly feeling like we got to do this and be here and go there. And our calendar and our to-do list can become just packed. So then how in the world do you carve out times for the things that are important to you? Um, don't let the urgent crowd out the important. So this to me, this question goes back to setting your intentions and knowing and, and taking a 30,000 foot view, to kind of taking a helicopter view, spacking back, get, walking away from it and saying, in my life, for me, these priorities are these values are of utmost importance to me. Maybe it's my family. Okay, family, but we can whittle that down into a million little to-dos. Maybe when I say family, what I really mean is I mean quality time. Okay, really, that's still abstract, Julie, get deeper. Maybe what I mean is I really like the conversations that we all have when we sit down at dinner. Okay, that feels concrete enough for me to actually do. Does that make sense? So when you can fly back out of the busy, out of the woods, <laughs> the trees, and, and say, okay, a value of mine is family, but that's too abstract. I'm with my family all day long. I'm carting people around. I'm doing all kinds of things. I'm whatever, but quality time, but still that's not, um, that's not concrete enough. I need to make it more, get, take, go back and then get slower. And then you recognize, okay, it's dinner time. It's the conversations that we have and we're all seated at the dinner table. That's not going to happen seven days a week, but I can make an effort slash a goal to make sure that we do it at least twice. And at those times that we everybody is really engaged and that we're all looking at each other and we're talking, maybe it's about playing a board game. Maybe it's you recognize that a value of you is self-care. Okay, I need to say, okay, what, is I, what do I mean by self-care? Is that a yoga class? Is that a walk around the neighborhood? Is that um, drinking eight glasses of water during the day? So how can you take those values, those things that do matter a great deal to you, and then boil it down into something very simple and figure out how you can fit that into your day in a very practical and logistical way? Does that make sense? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, I need to, like I'll, I'll just even use myself as an example too, because mm -hmm. like one of my values I would say is connectedness. Like I, I try to be connected. I want to understand and I want to feel connected to people. But if I'm going, 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 I kind of feel like maybe I'm just flying through my life, like speeding through all the stop signs and not connecting at all. So if I pull that 30,000 foot view back and I say, it matters to me, it's who I am and my character, it's one of my values to be connected. Then when I wake up in the morning, that means I make eye contact during breakfast. That means that when I see people and I'm passing them and whatever, that I look at them and I say, and I, and I listen, I take a beat to listen what they say when I ask them how they are. So it's where you use your values to direct your day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I guess there's a couple, we have a couple more questions. This is, um, so this question was, to me, it felt very, broad, but I hope you can uh, give some advice based on this. Um, somebody was saying that uh, over the last year, many, many, many of the days were spent with cancer appointments and life feels completely medicalized. How can, I mean, so I guess, how can setting goals outside of cancer help with that? Mm -hmm. So, so what I get from that, um, somebody writing in that message is that they're trying to explain to me, you know, hey, Julie, yeah, this is all great life without cancer, but I'm in the doctor's office all the gosh darn time. You know, I'm there all the time. I'm in a cancer center or I'm in a doctor's office or I'm if I'm not there, I'm planning it or scheduling it or I'm taking a treatment, whatever that is. If if my calendar and my um, time is so consumed by doctors appointments, how can I find space out of that? I guess my answer to that would be to simplify, to simplify the expectation of what I, what it means to have life quote unquote outside of cancer. That if we think of life outside of cancer as a 10 day cruise to the Bahamas, while wow, that sounds amazing, but we do not have time for that. <laughs> if we think about time of life outside of cancer as, um, going to a regularly occurring like lunch date with friends every Wednesday, that's probably is going to get hijacked or, or interrupted time and again by your schedule. Put those things in when they work, but also remember that the drive to and from can also be listening to music that you love and reminding yourself that you love it, being intentional and dedicated. I'm working with another young client, 28 years old, God love her. And she said to me that at the end of her yoga class, so first of all, she's doing yoga, so that's great. But she said to me at the end of her yoga class, they give out a free little tiny Dixie cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> and she's made it a dedicated practice of hers as she, and she lives in New York city. So she's walking back home or to the subway that she's not going to look at her phone, that she's not going to immediately call somebody that she's not going to do anything, but drink the tea and walk down the sidewalk or drink the tea and experience what's around her until that tiny little Dixie cup is gone. So a tiny Dixie cup of tea could also be a moment without cancer. It doesn't need to be these grand scheduled set apart times. How do we begin to remember that even just walking from point A to point B, you can choose to do it in an intentional way. Look up at the sky, listen to birds, see what else you see, people watch. Let that be a moment that you can escape the runaway thoughts of your brain. Okay, great. Well, so I think we've run out of time. I want to say thank you so much, Julie Larson. This has really been a very special presentation. I'm really uh, getting my mind turning. Um, and thank you to everybody who attended and um, submitted questions. Um, and so also I'd like to say uh, just to please fill out the survey that will show up at the very end of the webinar. It might take a minute uh, for that to pop up, but that really helps us to create better programming. Um, oh, and one other thing I guess is to mention, if I can get to it, um, we have uh, Julie Larson does our, our topic, she facilitates our topic driven roundtables. So this is for folks with ovarian cancer, but um, she will be facilitating the next 
topic driven roundtable, which is a little bit different from a webinar because folks are not muted and they can talk, speak freely throughout the presentation, but um, we'll have a guest speaker nutritionist then, that's April 10th. And you can find out uh, about a lot of our other programs like that one at sharedcancersupport.org. So thank you everyone and we'll end it there. Thank you, thanks for having me.